All right. Uh, well, thanks for introducing me. And uh, I'm sorry we are uh, late uh, for this session. But uh, anyway, uh, well begun is half done. And uh, as mm. I see it, uh, okay, we have six uh, speakers scheduled uh, for this uh, session. And without uh, further ado, may I ask uh, um, Dr. Mahroon Nisa Pathan, uh, is she here? Uh, yes. To, uh, yes, uh, to, and uh, I would request uh, to restrict your presentation to uh, eight to ten minutes uh, at the most, uh, you see, because of the paucity of time. Uh, so, Dr. Mehroon Issa Pathan, uh, with her paper on indigenous resistance discourses, a critical approach. Dr. Pathan, please uh, carry on. Yeah. Um, good evening. Am I audible? Am yes. I... Yes. Hello. I am audible. Yes. Yes. Uh, good evening, chair person. Yes. Yeah. Let me begin my presentation. I would be sharing my uh, sharing my uh, screen too. Uh, let me begin with the term discourse. The term discourse has become common in various fields uh, such as critical theory, sociology, linguistic philosophy, and social psychology. The term was used for common uh, knowledge. It is also used widely in analyzing uh, literary and non-literary text and is often employed uh, to signal a certain theoretical sophistication in the ways that are vague and sometimes of its history. It has the widest range of possible significations of any term in literary and cultural theory. And in theoretical texts, it is a term that is least defined. So discourse, again, critical theory, sociology, linguistic philosophy, social psychology, so and so forth. Um, the term discourse has also been defined by Collins Conscience English Dictionary as verbal communication, talk, conversation, a formal treatment of subject in speech or writing, a unit of text used by linguists for the analysis of linguistic phenomena that range over more than the sentence. To discourse means the ability to reason, the, uh, to discourse and open, to speak, to write about formally, unquote. So uh, due to the constraints of time, I would be skipping up uh, the uh, whole definition that I have been uh, given in my uh, research paper about discourse. Uh, can I uh, share my screen, please? Yes. Sure. Uh, yes. Can I share my screen? Yes. Yes. Is it visible? Is it visible? Uh, yes. Not yet. Uh... Please. Yes. Okay. Yes. Is it visible, please? Uh, well, uh, you are visible, but not your screen. My screen should be visible. Yeah, please. Uh, the, uh, can I request the uh, Cape Cameron to please share the screen? It would be easy for me to make the presentation. Yes. Is there anyone from Cape Cameron? Share please. my screen. I think. Uh, yeah. If you go below, there is a um, there is a logo present now. I guess uh, if you press it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the presentation should yeah, come yeah. up. Your entire screen. That is uh, the no, Hello, button that I need. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes, sir. Open your PPT in the desktop. PPT. Yeah, first you have to open the PPT. Then you have to come to the browser uh, and you have to tap the window. Is it visible? Uh, first you have to open the uh, PPT map and then you have to come back to uh, share screen and or present now. It's written. Uh, can you see present now over there? He has left. No. So, can we proceed further uh, in the meantime while she joins? Yes. 
yes i guess uh, if it is taking too much of time uh, dr pathan uh, you can just speak on uh, we are all listening to you Uh, sir, she's left. Oh, she has left. Yes, sir. So, can we start with the next presentation and uh, schedule Dr. Pathan yes. later if there is time later? Yes. Uh, sir. Uh, okay. No. Uh, Mr. Shakil Ahmad Wani and Sayyid Akib Kadri, their joint paper on perspectives on the status of Muslim women in India. Are they both here? Shakil Wani. Oh, yes, yes. Sir. yes, sir. I am present here. Okay, so seems to be a very interesting topic. Please uh, go ahead and uh, restrict yourself uh, to 10 minutes at the most, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, is my presentation visible, sir? Uh, you are visible, but not your presentation. Oh, wait a moment, sir. Is it visible, sir? Uh, no. No. Uh, okay. Yes. Yes. It is visible now. Okay. Uh, this is Shri Ahmad Mani. Uh, my co-author is Shri Rakib Kadri. We are from University of Kashmir, Srinagar. Uh, our paper is about perspectives on the states of Muslim women in India, prospects and challenges. First, let's see the term status how it has been defined. The Government of India Report 1974 describes the term status as a rank in a societal system or subsystem which can be distinguished from and simultaneously related to other ranks via its nominated rights and responsibilities. A vague definition creating a notion of status that necessarily involves contrast and grading. Now, there are certain determining skills of status, which can be termed as indicators of status. For example, income, assets, prospects, education, and training in skills that provide better chance of employment, state of health, rights, and freedoms. Concerning every set of indices of status, women have been relatively seen as occupying a much inferior status than that of their male compatriots. Stereotypes based on faith and value system are used to justify a relegated secondary role of women in the society. Question of women states revolves around the discussion of equality between men and women. The low esteem of women in India is attributed to inequality of status and restricted opportunities. In medieval India, women were deprived of the fundamental rights of education and played a subordinate role in every other field of the societal structure. Working in farms and agricultural fields also didn't modify their status. Now, let's see the Muslim society first. Position of women in a Muslim society takes into account, first, rights granted by Islamic law, and second, actual ground situation of the society. In this context, the primary sources for determining the states of women are the Quran and the Sunnah. Sunnah means the statement and actions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Religion in its true separate is intimately concerned with the spiritual development of its followers, which is not possible to attain in a socially stagnant state of affairs. In India, Muslims are not only a minority, but also a community that is tradition bound and economically as well as educationally backward. Multiple reasons abound as to why Muslim women do not enthusiastically utilize whatever amenities of development are accessible to them. Therefore, the improvement of the social position of women in particular and the transformation of Muslim society in general depends much upon the modification of community behavior. Muslim women have been socially, economically, physically, and psychologically exploited sometimes in the name of religion and other times in the use of social, social customs and traditions. Despite such a dismal scenario, Muslim women in India have the potential to become a catalyst for sustainable development subject to their emancipation. Their present status is a stark reflection of the supremacy of the traditional outlook 
improving their present day condition can ensure their contribution to the progress and reconstruction of the community while also guaranteeing the growth and rejuvenation of the entire nation now let us see the socio economic paradigm upon the arrival of european traders in india in the 16th century the condition of women had utterly degraded owing to the stagnation of society by religious traditions and customs for the system female infanticide child marriage the inhuman practice of sati and unjust restrictions on widow marriage were only some of the social evils in vogue when the british colonists entered entered india with the promise of a new culture and social values based on equality several laws were ordained during the british rule in india to eliminate social evils widespread in society but only a select portion of women belonging to the upper class succeeded to benefit from the new culture but the attitude and behavioral patterns of hindus underwent drastic changes the muslims however could not profit from this novel culture the hindu class willingly adopted the western ideals of a humanistic and democratic way of life on the other hand the muslims despite being endowed with the progressive leadership like that of sir said ahmed khan remained committed to their narratives and declined to imbibe democratic values or even modern education this is where the rift between the hindus and muslims developed ultimately giving birth to an inequality of status for which the blame was placed on none other than the muslims themselves minority status alien culture erosion of autonomy fear of loss of identity penchant of traditions and the support of religious leaders adversely affected the position of muslim women and inhibited them from reaping the fruits of modern education and employment now various indicators have been identified for the, the, this regressive condition the most significant of which is the lack of contribution in the socio economic sphere now the primary causes for this backwardness are not religious in nature but social like poverty illiteracy marginalization apart from being the victims of poverty Muslims seem to have developed a fatalistic attitude and have silently come to accept inequality and discrimination as their inevitable destiny. Similarly, Muslim women have continued to endure backwardness in most areas of their lives and have generally demonstrated a sluggish nature in taking the benefits of modernization and development. Now let's see the recent scenario. Recent years have shown us that some primordial signs of change, albeit with several obstacles, are beginning to appear, and the self-inflicted isolation is gradually vanishing. Some of these changes have endeavored to take the Muslim women out of the protected milieu of the past into the urgency and complexity of the modern world. Her universe is no longer circumscribed by the four walls of the house. it now incorporates the broader areas of civic and national interests extending even to the international relations muslim women are consciously availing themselves of the opportunities which every every citizen of india enjoys these women can be seen in the fields of teaching medicine the army and even the judiciary many improvements have taken place in the area of education employment and parda for muslim women especially in the last three decades there is a positive indication showing that muslims are consciously consciously experiencing change through the rate though the rate and extent of change have varied among the rural and urban areas and the different socio economic classes in her study the changing half a study of indian muslims husain noticed that rather than the religious factors alone other structural and institutional paradigms like customs traditions moral systems patriarchy the misconception of islamic principles lack of self initiative or inspiration and lack of support from male members jointly hamper the prospects of women to adopt new values and conform to the changing milieu diverse variables like education age family structure income duration of stay in town exposure to mass media etc have contributed ominously in altering the attitude of muslim women towards the course of modernization and social change furthermore it has been suggested that the backwardness of muslim women is the result of the absence of a refined culture among the community generally clearly implying that islam has not come to their rescue but it can be misleading to generalize the overall condition of the women by ignoring the inherent problem of class difference the women belonging to the upper strata have a miserable degree of emancipation notwithstanding the community or religious affiliation 
while the women in lower strata are backward and conservative. In this cultural context, mere reliance on law or forward demands of change will turn out to be a futile exercise. What's required is a reform of such proportion which can enhance the educational states of men, women and increase their participation in economic activities. Now, there are some Muslim women networks who work for the emancipation of women. We see several networks or coalitions of Muslim women organizations have come into existence that strive to develop a dialogue among themselves with the clerical establishment and with the larger community on women's issues in general, rather than focusing on individual women. For this purpose, they hold conferences at which resolutions are passed, which are then published in the media and organized rallies, often in conjunction with secular women's organizations. They also run legal awareness campus for poor women in rural areas and urban slums and frequently scrutinize and even interfere with an apparently anti-feminine fatwa, religious ruling, is issued by clerks in the country to draw widespread public attention. Notable examples are like Sharifa Khanam, founder of an NGO called Stubbs in Padukati, Tamil Nadu, that aims to support victims of domestic abuse. She currently leads a controversial and widely publicized campaign to construct an all-women mask. She was the 10th child of a poor rural family and had lost her father before she was born. Due to their poverty, her family was never able to arrange her marriage and she has remained unmarried. Another one is Rehana Sultan, director of the Center for Women's Studies at Molan Azad National University, Hyderabad. Another well-known uh, spokesperson for Muslim women's legal rights. Compelled by personal misfortune to dedicate her life towards the empowerment of Muslim women. She also runs a small NGO, Basme Shams in Iswa, that provides marriage counseling and legal advice to distrusted women. Now, what are the major challenges? The chronological history of Muslim women and their wide-ranging role elucidates that the Muslim community has been facing varied problems and challenges, primarily as citizens of India and secondarily as members of India's largest minority in an unstable inter-community relationship. Their disadvantaged socio-economic states depicts a need for social prospects which, however, is not a characteristic limited solely to Muslim women, but is aggravated by their minority position within an overall framework of a social drawback for most of the Indian women. Studies have revealed that most Muslims in India do not feel themselves to be Shakir, a part uh, of the Shakir, uh, please, right, con please conclude in one minute. Uh, uh. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Now coming to the conclusion. Uh, several decades have passed since the independence of India, yet women in Muslim communities still face considerable challenges as citizens of this nation and as members of India's largest minority. In 1983, the Gopal Singh Committee designated members as Muslims as a backward community in India. A dominant feature of this backwardness is their exceptionally poor socio-economic status, particularly of Muslim women. Most Muslim women remain invisible workers in the informal economy. The Muslim stake in public employment is less than 3%. With such a picture of marginalization, it is a foreseeable inevitability that the corresponding figures for Muslim women are further headed towards the bottom. A want of information on Muslim women contributes to the reinforcement of cultural stereotypes serving to muddle their life, life experiences. Consequently, the notion that Muslim women states in India is attributable to certain inherent, incontrovertible Islamic features or that their social states originate solely from Muslim law is widely prevalent. In this context, where the Sharia is used to justify women's subservience, it is imperative for Muslim women in India to enter the dialogue on Sharia with reference to personal law and challenge their historic austericism through religious knowledge. Additionally, it is crucial for Muslim women and men to debate among themselves the possible causes and remedies to alleviate their poor states as citizens of India. And the last is the non-existence of social opportunities for Muslim women is a crucial issue demanding urgent action. An improvement in literacy rates would directly influence Muslim women's social, economic and political states as India's citizens. The acknowledgement of the universality of women's rights by the international community is relevant to the debate on Islam and women's rights. Principally, regarding women's rights in the family system, the formation of forms and associations of Muslim women, men and women, in a initiatives in the 1980s is also an important step towards sustaining public debate on Muslim women's issues. Muslim women and men must team up with individuals and organizations that are dedicated to their realization of Muslim women's rights. The coalition of Muslim women 
with the women's movement in India as well as movements for secularism, democracy, and human rights is a critical in forging a common front against the forces that are oppressed to women is opposed to women is self determination. With this, I thank you all of you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Shakil. And it is really heartening to see that uh, uh, a paper on such an important topic has been presented by two males. Um, uh, that is on the marginalization of Muslim women. And uh, Shakil and Sayyid Akib have uh, well covered several aspects very comprehensively, in including stereotyping the socioeconomic paradigms that uh, result in the marginalization of Muslim women. And uh, he has also taken a bold stance uh, asking women to challenge their authority. And uh, uh, may I now ask uh, Dr. Pathan to resume her presentation and please restrict yourself to two minutes, uh, Dr. Pathan. Dr. Hello. Pathan, are you Yes. Yes. Hello. Are you able to? Am I audible, yes. sir? Yes. 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 Hello. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, my screen is shared. Is my screen we visible, sir? Is my presentation visible? visible? You are visible. Okay. Again, the same problem. Um, Sir, you may take up another uh, okay. presentation. All okay. Right, for right. another person. Uh, Meanwhile, uh, I will. Okay. Mr. T.K. Jagish, is he here? T.K. Yes, Jagish. Sir. Yes, sir. Okay, yes, uh, TK Jigdish is uh, going to speak on indigeneity in Indian culture and Eurocentric overlapping. Um, uh, Mr. Jigdish, please start and okay. uh, conclude in 10 minutes, please. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Shall I start, sir? Sure, sure, please. Okay. Uh, very good afternoon. Oh, sorry, good, good evening uh, to Anurag, sir and uh, other paper presenters and uh, all others who are gathering in this platform. My paper name is Indigeneity in Indian Culture and Eurocentric Overlapping. As the title indicates, uh, this, this essay, this paper is an attempt uh, to try to understand the indigeneity of Indian culture and the uh, cultural overlapping of Eurocentric notions over it. How Eurocentric notions try to overlap other cultures, especially our Indian culture, that's what the question raises here in this study. Indian cultural background is taken uh, for analyzing the context here. Okay. As we all know, our India has a rich cultural background. Uh, the culture of India refers collectively uh, to the thousands of distinct and unique cultures of all religious and uh, communities present in India. Uh, we know that Vedic culture, uh, different uh, darshanas, biggest epics, Ayurveda, uh, Yoga, Nati Shastra, uh, Kama Sutra, etc. are the flowers of our Indian uh, culture. Okay. India's languages, religions, dance, music, architecture, food, and customs differ from place to place within this country. It is an amalgamation of several divergent things, but we can see a thread that unites all these uh, diversities. That's why we called unity in diversity. The rich heritage of India is one of the world's oldest civilizations. And, and, and an attempt, uh, spe uh, spe uh, uh, special, and an important speciality of this culture is it's all embracing nature. That's one of the most important speciality of this culture. Uh, we have all an all embracing nature. Let us take the philosophical wealth of India. Here we have uh, so many philosophical ideologies. They are called, in Indian terminology, it is called darshanas. darshanas. 
so many darshanas or philosophical ideologies were emerged from this culture for example if you take astika darshanas uh, they are a six in number vedanta yoga vaisheshika and so many uh, six uh, types of astika darshanas are there in indian culture and nastika darshanas are there that is the atheistic type of philosophies materialistic type of philosophies were emerged from this country and they were originated in bc that's a speciality vedic philosophy in india is considered as one of the oldest in philosophies in this world out of this vedic philo- uh, philosophical te- text it emerged the ayurveda yoga architecture archery etc etc okay and uh, they added the wealth and vastness of indian cultural heritage they are our indigenous culture of this nation the wealth of our nation even a travel in the south indian temples give as a proof how rich was indian culture huh? but the problem is what happened is uh, the invaders came to our nation and started polluting it especially after the invasion of british colonialists in the 17th century they tried they tried to change our cultural heritage and tried to make a slavish mind in indian mindset they uh, they implemented an education strategy here it is called the macaulay minute in 1835 lord macaulay was a british historian and whig politician he played the major role in the introduction of english and western concepts to the education systems in india he tried his level best to inject a british culture in our blood of indians what macaulay intended Uh, through his education minute is very obvious in his statement he wants to create a type of people a class of persons indians in blood and color and english in taste opinion and moral in moral in intellect that's what his his mentality that was that was his intention okay <clears throat> yes it works that uh, that uh, english education works in our indian mind set still it continues still we continue almost the same mode of education even after 73 years of after our independence we indian people still bear that western inclination in our mind a slavish type of mentality towards the western english culture that is uh, it technically called cultural imperialism that is what happening here cultural imperialism is a major discussion topic in the culture studies and post colonial studies even after the 73 years of independence we are culturally ruling by the, the city uh, by sitting in their own country their influence is still there in our indian mindset we think that their culture is a great and ours is under mark we keep a kind of inferiority complex still in our mind many indians consider western food western style of dressing their marriage systems and their style of living are superior and greater than our indians thus we try to imitate their culture of living this is called technically it is called mimicry it is a term coined by famous post colonial theorist homi k baba we can see various modes of western imitations in our living even when a marriage invitation letter is typed for a rural area in kerala we prefer to type it in english we prefer to type it in english language why we consider english language is superior than the malayalam and other english languages the same mentality is obvious when we prefer pepsi or coca cola than coconut water these are the injections of english scholars in our mindset indian brain they wanted to make all eurocentric eh? that is they wanted to make all the knowledge systems centered around to english culture this previously mentioned lord macaulay and max muller were the two english intellectuals behind the the forming of board and chair in oxford university aryan invasion theory is a product of that chair uh, british uh, elaborations of the aryan invasion theory became powerful and convenient ideological tool 
ഇൻ ജനറേറ്റിംഗ് ലെജിറ്റിമസി ഫോർ ബ്രിട്ടീഷ് റൂൾ ദേ പ്രൊപ്പോണ്ട് ദാറ്റ് ആര്യൻസ് ആർ ഹൈലി അഡ്വാൻസ്ഡ് ആൻഡ് കൾച്ചറലി സുപ്പീരിയർ റേസ് ഹു മൈഗ്രേറ്റഡ് ടു ഇന്ത്യ ഫ്രം ദ നോർത്ത് ഏൺ പാർട്സ് ഓഫ് ദ യൂറോപ്പ് ആൻഡ് ദേ ആൻഡ് ദ തിയറൈസ്ഡ് ദാറ്റ് വേദാസ് ആർ ദ പ്രോഡക്ട്സ് ഓഫ് ആര്യൻ റേസ് okay so the intention of this british theoreticians were to make a notion that origin of all the knowledge is europe based they are culturally superior to others actually this is a, this is a proved fake theory actually this word aryan is there in our vedic scriptures uh, like our vedas uh, ramayana we can, we can see that word arya in rigveda we can see a mantra krunvando vishwamarya here arya means in vedic literature arya means uh, a noble person it is not uh, the name of any any per, uh, any race uh, who, who came from europe actually its meaning is uh, a great person a noble citizen actually we are not our culture is not against any other culture our culture has great ability to accept differences and diversities diversities anobhadra kratavo yantu vishwada is a mantra from rigveda its meaning is let all the noble thoughts come to me from all directions we are ready to accept it whether it's from europe whether it is from africa whether it is from uh, new zealand or anywhere in the world we are ready to accept it from karl marx confucius or any other person in this world it has great acceptability but we are not ready to degrade ourselves uh, and jagish uh, yes jagish yes please so then, uh, i will, I will okay. conclude it uh, that uh, degrading of this culture is not at all acceptable it is a slavery we are proud to our wealthy and ancient indian heritage it has a great flexibility and readiness to accept all all those coming from any part of this world but degrading our culture and the slavery mentality that is not acceptable that overlapping our culture is not at all acceptable the destruction of our culture is not acceptable because this is what the extract of my paper so let me conclude it is thank you thank you sir okay um, thank you very much uh, mr jagish for concluding in time uh, oh. i thank you Uh, you gave a very comprehensive um, uh, in the short time that you had you referred co- uh, comprehensively to the ancient knowledge scriptures ideologies and philosophies of india how they enriched the indian culture and you uh, told how the crux of the problem uh, for our present ailments uh, has been the invaders the sl- slavish mentality and the cultural imperialism and it was good to see you refer to several post colonial theories such as of bhaba may i now ask yes. the next presenter uh, uh, dr pathan okay uh, please uh, conclude in 7 minutes uh, okay hello am i audible yes. sir now hello. yes 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 and uh, the screen is also been seen am i right yes yes hello yes yes, yes. Uh, sir uh, let me begin my presentation uh, with uh, what is discourse uh, i have given a detailed definition about that as it has been uh, described uh, by uh, the defined by the collins uh, concise dictionary in 1988 that it's a verbal communication talk conversation a formal treatment of a subject in speech or writing a unit of text used by linguist for analysis of linguistic phenomena that range over more than a sentence to discourse means the ability to reason to discourse means to open to speak to write about formally to give forth music uh, that's again in a 14th century from medieval latin discourse the arguments from latin uh, running to and fro from discourse uh, that's unquote uh, that I, definition that i have uh, tried to give it from concise dictionary so to read to speak to discuss a text verbal expression to reason is the meaning of discourse so the meaning of discourse changes from one academic discipline to another moving on to what uh, uh, michel foucault has mentioned in the archaeology of knowledge and it 
Sarah Mills a uh, book written uh, on discourse in 2007 it provides a detailed analysis of the term discourse by Foucault and uh, the term uh, actually has been defined in three different definitions definitions like the general domain of all statements that is all utterances or text which have meaning and which have some effects in the real world count as discourse the second an individualizable group of statements then uh, the third is like uh, is one which is used uh, again by foucault when he is discussing the particular uh, structure with, within discourses that is a group of utterances which seems to be regulated in some way and which seems to have a coherence and a force to them in common now moving ahead with what is resistance i would be uh, limiting myself because uh, due to time constraint uh, what is uh, resistance so barbara harlow mentioned that the word resistance uh, which means mukawama was first applied in a description of palestinian literature in 1966 by the palestinian writer and critic gassan kenifani for him resistance literature invoked a distinction between an occupied people and people in exile so such literature was seen to be identifiable and significant accompaniment to the project of political military and social striving for national liberation so for uh, silvin kurzo resist uh, in the book called as resistance and caribbean literature resistance is an act of complex acts designed to rid a people of its oppressor be they be they slave masters or multinational corporations uh, moving ahead with what is resistance discourses uh, i would be just giving one or two definitions and because due to time constraint again i would be talking about the problems in that uh, the problematics of this particular definition so the above definition of resistance fail to address three major areas of critical concern the first problem arises with the political concern the center periphery notions of resistance can actually work to reinscribe center periphery relations the second problem is with the literary text and the third problem is that uh, has to set aside the very pervasive theory of power which foucault puts forward in his the archaeology of knowledge the theory that power itself inscribes its resistances and so in the process seeks to contain them there is the literary text as a structure of intentionality and there in the social text as a communicative gesture of pure pure availability uh, moving on to the term indigenous i would not go into much details of that i have already provided in detail in my research article uh, marginalized sections aborigines Maori in the New Zealand, First Nations in Canada, Indigenous in US, Janajatis in India, or tribes in anthropology, or they are also been referred as notified communities in the administrative parlance in many countries, Indigenous people in discourse of human rights, as Adivasis in the terminology of ancient activists, and these people they have been affected due to the process of colonialism, imperialism, modernity. and globalization uh, moving ahead with uh, who is uh, debra harry and why i uh, mention uh, or why i was interested in mentioning her the very reason was uh, uh, there are two specific reasons why i need to mention debra harry her own contribution to indigenous people and indigenous studies i heard her talk on indigenous people their rights their protection and so on her lecture is available at youtube to a great extent she talked on biocolonialism and how biocolonialism facilitates indigenous people's knowledge and resources used by the dominants she resisted and represented the indigenous people's rights at the conference she mentioned about the traditional culture traditional knowledge medicines biological material language dance that actually represents the indigenous and rightly pointed out i quote and quote protection is not on the table uh, unquote moving further these are the various publications of uh, debra harry why just uh, to mention one indigenous peoples peoples and genes dispute uh, then one more is there decolonizing 
colonial construction of indigenous identity, a conversation between Deborah Harry and Leone Farmer. That is, again, the publication that has come up. Moving further with the Bionias, there are different Bionias, and basically they have been talking about uh, how indigenous people's knowledge and resources are utilized without actually giving them what they deserve. Then medicinal herbs that have been used, the natural resources. So let me mention uh, what G. N. Devi sir has mentioned yesterday that uh, when uh, when you present a research article on indigenous people and get it published for which you require a paper and again the paper is made by cutting down the trees which is a source of survival for these people so how you do justice to these people uh, moving further um, this how they are been talking uh, these bioneers are been raising up issues and talking about uh, actually they are resisting and representing the indigenous rights for that matter Moving further, the interdisciplinary approach to this particular uh, um, uh, studies, which is called as indigenous studies, there should be an interdisciplinary approach to indigenous studies. Like you have British literature as a part of our curriculum, so should be the indigenous studies. No more indigenous literature should be studied in isolation It uh, as it focuses on culture, religion, language, literature, and so on and so forth. It should be included in the courses being taught at schools, colleges, and university. Instead of isolating indigenous studies by having separate universities established, we have different branches of studies like post-colonial studies, for instance. So it should be included as a part of these studies, uh, not as an uh, rather optional. Moving further, uh, how resistance discourses are formulated. I have already mentioned about that through literary writings, through text, through discourse, maybe verbal or non-verbal communication. Writing itself is an act of resistance. As you put the pen on the paper, the black and white words themselves are nothing but they are the for they are formulating the resistance discourses. Next. Uh, moving further, uh, let me give the example of uh, the tribal community as mentioned by uh, many of the speakers, uh, because uh, since three days we have been into this uh, discourse on indigenous studies. And let me mention here Birsa Munda, who was a folk hero and a tribal freedom fighter hailing from the Munda tribe. He was spearheaded behind the millennial movement that aroused in Bihar and Jharkhand Belt in the early 19th century. Okay, Colonization. Yes, I am. I am uh, concluding. I am okay. concluding. So, okay. okay. Uh, go to the earlier slide. This one. This one. So, this this one. Birsa Munda. Yeah. So these are the way in which he has resisted and now being re represented. So we do have in uh, the name of Birsa Agricultural uh, University, Birsa Institute, and so on and so forth, various institutions that have been established in the name of Bursa, Birsa Munda. And Krishna, he has written a book called The Life and the Times of Birsa Munda, uh, moving ahead. That is the second last slide. I mean to say the last slide now, I would be concluding. Indigenous studies are available at University of Oklahoma, University of Oxford, and so on and so forth. So various universities, like you have Toronto, you have First Nations University of Canada. What I mean to say is, like, why not to include the indigenous studies? The basic argument of my presentation is, why not to include them into the main curriculum so that it is brought to the main uh, stream literature for that matter? Thank you so much, sir, for giving me uh, patient listening. And thank you, each and everyone, for giving me this opportunity to present my views uh, on resistance discourses uh, related to the indigenous people indigenous studies for that matter so thank you one, uh, once again and um, for giving me this opportunity to have a global discourse thank you so much sir uh, uh, thank you dr pathan uh, and it was uh, a very good presentation you have worked very hard on your presentation we could see that and i wish there could be some discussion on this but we are short of time you come Covered several aspects such as discourses, the theories of power such as by Foucault, by uh, colonialism, and your emphasis on interdisciplinary approach to indigenous studies is very well placed and pertinent. So thank you for an excellent presentation. I now uh, um, go on to the fourth uh, presentation uh, of this session, that is R.S. Athira. Is she here? Yes, sir. R.S. Athira. 
Yes, sir. Okay, please go ahead. Introduce your topic and uh, your 10 minutes start now. Okay. The screen visible, sir? Uh, no, not to me. Uh, okay, yes, yes. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my paper is titled The Dynamic Gender Interrogating the Voice of Native American Two Spirits. The whole corpus of indigenous literature in the world is replete with narratives of the predicament of native people in colonial and post colonial scenarios. Native American culture chronicles the rich diversity and socio-cultural aspects of tribal history and modernity. The aspect of alternatives to the Western categories of man and woman existed in Native American tribes, which is a reflection of the vast diversity in gender and sexuality in indigenous cultures. Such dynamic individuals are termed two spirits who held special ceremonial and important economic roles in pre-colonial Native America. Colonization transforms such gender and sexual identities, and the contemporary effect on the two-spirit tradition is the adaptation of a modern Western gay identity. My paper analyzes the horrifying political ordeal and the subtle exercise of power over the two-spirit natives that has led to struggles of cultural ownership and indigenous resistance by these gender-variant individuals. The Western concept of dividing gender based on anatomy is not followed in native tribes generally. The greatest archetype of this thought pattern among indigenous people can be seen in the Native American two-spirit community. Two-spirit people are believed to possess the qualities of both the male and the female, and hence they are considered to be sacred and a mediator between the physical and the spiritual. During the pre-colonial times, such individuals were highly revered and they held respective positions within the tribe as religious leaders, skilled artists, matchmakers, healers, medicine people, tricksters, shamans, etc. The tribal cultures always had more than two gender in their cultural pattern and the assignment of gender was not based on anatomy but on the personality and contributions of an individual to the tribe. Since two-spirit persons fulfill the roles and duties of both the male and female gender, they were given an alternative gender or third gender status. The gender variant people in Native America were given the derogatory name Bergash by the early Spanish colonizers because of their affinity for same-sex relationships. The colonizers who adhered to the rigid binary gender system and Christianity could not understand the tribal cultural system of gender. This led to them branding each third gender person as being abnormal, deviant, or by the modern Western term, gay. The term Bergash was literally translated as kept boy and was used to denote male homosexuality by the colonizers. Such people were shunned and humiliated for their sexuality. The term two-spirit came in the 1990s by the efforts of a group of gender variant native people who no longer wanted to be identified by any label assigned by the colonizers and wanted a positive term that would highlight the sacred aspect of their gender identity rather than focusing on sexuality. The two-spirit people actually reverse the Euro-American notion that a person's sex is a consistent surety and that a person's gender identity and sexual role forever correspond to their etymological sex. Contrary to the Western beliefs, which gives more prominence and authority to the male gender in the binary gender system, Native Americans give equal importance to both man and woman and considers the female gender to be special and meaningful. In the Western perspective, people with homosexual affinities are degrading themselves to the level of women when they display pure masculine qualities. However, the tribal cultures consider the persons who display qualities of the other gender to be a separate gender in their cultural system and give such persons honor and respect without degrading or being humiliated by them. Each two-spirit person has a different sexual affinity. Some may be homosexual, some heterosexual, and some bisexual. Sexuality as believed by Western culture is not the criterion for determining a two-spirit person. It's the qualities of sacredness and selflessness and being an important contributor for the welfare of the tribal society, spiritually, economically, and ceremonially, that becomes a marker for such a unique status. Gender variants always existed in tribal societies and were most prominent during the pre-colonial times. 
Colonization is the extensive element in the dissipation of such harmless practices as the colonizers strongly believed in the ideology of the binary and Christian doctrine of homosexuality being a sin. Heteropatriarchy and heteronormativity are other aspects of colonization that drained other sexual orientations and gender identities in the Native American tribal culture. The cultural repression by the church abrogated the power of the tribes to continue and preserve their own systems and norms. Violent punishments were the after effects of not adhering to the rules of following a cisgender pattern of behavior. In the upsurge of heterosexual and patriarchal norms, two-spirit persons and women lost their ownership rights and were degraded to the position of being secondary, despised and dependent persons. When the existence and daily life was threatened, the matters of gender and sexuality took a backseat. Western homophobia contributed to the tribes being even more secretive about gender variants. Biopower or automation of authority for controlling people in large groups is a significant component in the power structure of the colonizers. Michel Foucault in his theories of sexuality and biopower asserts that sex becomes an important condition of persons and communities when the modernized national territory comes into being and matters of sex becomes a prospect of life or death as a method of executing the dominance of the state. It makes gender, sexuality and race the crucial realms of the dominance of the settler state and thereby determines the colonization of the native people. A silence around sexuality becomes a new norm in native communities because of the sexual chain that has been passed on for generations due to the logics of heteropatriarchy and heteronormativity, the rationale of colonialism. The relationship of sexuality to colonial power is so intense and sexual brutality is a concrete and psychological apparatus of colonialism. The power of the nation state has overpowered the pure native bodies through repression and barbarism that any ideology to get out of such power structure becomes a constant resistance against the consistent surveillance of the colonizing regime. Biopower engulfed the soul of the cure and the docile bodies in the struggle for power and freedom. Acculturation is a key factor in the social, cultural and psychological impact that the balancing of two cultures have caused upon the native bodies. When the colonizers arrived, they brought with them a system of sovereignty that did not blend with the native way of living. The elements of tribal harmony with nature, worshipping gods and goddesses, matrilineal system, different categories of gender, various tribal languages, and the tribal way of thought process and freedom in particular about sexuality, puzzled and disturbed the obstructionist colonizer thoroughly. The perils of settler colonialism were the arrival of Christian missionaries and the transfer of tribal children to boarding schools as the tribal pattern of living were considered to be untrue. Thus, a different generation of tribal children who grew up in the boarding schools became the sufferers of acculturation and multiculturalism. The new environment of the Western life and habits erased the nativeness in these people and since homosexuality was considered a sin, they were forced to live a heterosexual life irrespective of their desire. Multiculturalism also muddled many of the new generation natives as they were not able to understand their two spirit identity. Everyone was labeled as gay in the Western eyes and gay was considered an aberrant and a fault. Settler colonialism unsettled the colonial bodies and the colonial minds equitably and the ideology of the native as the other essentially formulated the Western subjectivity. Cultural imperialism is a major element that the natives in general and the two-spirit people in particular encounter in the neo-colonial era. The colonizers have brought with them not only Christianity, missionaries and the boarding schools, but the colonial culture brought diseases, smoking, alcohol and drugs into the reservation that caused in many of the native youth getting addicted and falling prey to a number of illnesses as worse as the AIDS and tuberculosis. The pure native body was colonized and the native nationalisms cultivated homophobia as a part of modern nation building and erasing the traces of nativity in the tribes people. Altering traditions to suit the heteropatriarchal views and forcing heteronormativity into the system naturalized the modern constructions of power. The tribes started erasing the memory of gender and sexual variants from their reservations or they made it secretive fearing punishment. Such expulsion forced the queer youth to leave the tribes and merge with the western gay communities in the cities without understanding the difference between their two-spirit identity and modern gay identities. Two-spirit literature is a category that is emerging in the field of cure literature and writings. Earlier, there were only anthropological writings about two-spirit people who were not completely appropriate as most of them were Westerners who interpreted the two-spirit culture according to their own sensibilities rather than portraying the actual truth. Starting One from minute, the 1980s... Okay, sir. 
Starting from the 1980s to the contemporary times, many writings, both fictional and non-fictional, have come about the Blue Spirit people, some of them being an eye-opener in this underexplored realm of culture. Even though there are a number of writings about Blue Spirit people, the area is still largely unexplored by researchers and writers. After a setback from the colonizers, the Two-Spirit movement slowly started gaining importance in the late 90s and the movement primarily fixated on what makes a native Two-Spirit, the ceremonial and medicinal power. Ceremonies are an important part of Native American life. The native tribes believe in the power of ceremonies and the worshipping of elements of nature through these observ observances as a cleansing and healing process for both the body and the mind. From time immemorial, two-spirit communities believe it to be the conductors of ritual-based ceremonies as they are presumed to be the go-between some is the man and the woman, the physical and the spiritual, the body and the soul. Ritualistic ceremonies like sweat lodges and sun dances are revived by the two-spirit communities nowadays as a means of going back to their true essence and spirit. Another important aspect of being a two-spirit is the importance of medicinal powers. The two-spirit medicinal pouches are famous for their sacred herbs and healing abilities. The medicinal knowledge is usually oral and passed on from generation to generation. So to conclude, right from the time of the early explorers of the new world, the two-spirit identity has remained an unsolved puzzle. When they could not understand the essence of the identity, the explorers termed this barbaric and uncivilized and tried to erase it from the tribal cultures. Heteropatriarchy and heteronormativity blended with cultural imperialism and acculturation contributed to the destruction of this unique Native American community until an attempt to revamp it by its own individuals started in the early 1990s. The revitalization of the two-spirit identity is imperative for the advancement of the indigenous people all over the universe. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you, Athira. That was indeed a very impressive presentation and I can see that you have done intensive research on this topic. Thank uh, you. Well, thank you, you, sir. You talked about several concepts like heteropatriarchy, heteronormativity, homophobia, bipower, the theories of Foucault and others, and how these things were used as power constructs for domination. I'm very surprised to see the richness of native cultures, how Native Americans gave a space and sanction to alternate sexualities, which ironically their colonizers with their pride of white man's uh, burden could not uh, incorporate in their cultures, haven't been able to incorporate even till now. So th th that's a very good piece of research that you have done. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I now call upon uh, Alka Theres Babu, uh, is she here? Alka? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, well, sir. Your presentation is on blood berries. Um, very, it uh, seems to be very interesting. Please go ahead and uh, yes, introduce your yes. topic. Good evening, all respected chair of the session and dear co participants. Myself, Alaga Therese Babu, PhD scholar at St. Joseph's College, Devagiri, Calicut, Kerala. As it is already mentioned, the title of my paper is Blood Berries Strategic Reclaiming of the Ethnic Correlatives in Maurus Kenny's Yakini and Wild Strawberries. I'm happy that some of the previous presenters have provided me with a conceptual background to my study so that I can evade and elaborate description. Uh, let me start with my central argument. My argument is Aboriginal literature in general and Kenny's works in Maurice Kenny's works in particular incorporate certain ethnic images or symbols in them repeatedly to achieve the end of transforming the melancholy to mourning, re-establish an ethnic pride, infuse the feeling of collective identity and thereby resist hegemony. So basically, the recurrence of ethnic correlatives or culture-specific symbols in the works of Aboriginal writers led the natives to resist hegemony and thus claim their space in the current socio-cultural scenario of the place. As we all know, with the latter half of the 20th century, postmodernism and its offshoots ensured the replacement of meta-narratives with mini-narratives. Indigenous writings such as Canadian First Nation literature, Indian tribal literature, Native American literature, and so on, are being studied and analyzed in the academic circles, considering them as mini-narratives and counter-discourses. The literary and artistic renderings of the ethnic groups of various spaces exhibit similarities because of the similarities to the level of exploitation and suppression they experienced. This paper focuses on the how and why of the recurrence of ethnic correlatives in the works of the Native American author Maurice Kenny. 
the driving force of Kenny's short story, Yakini, and his poem, Wild Strawberries, these are the two primary texts that I have taken for the study, is berries, which can be considered, the berries can be considered as a cultural metaphor to represent the entire Mohawk culture to which the author Maurice Kenny belongs to. The intensity with which Kenny brings into play the berry motif and how it helps to fulfill the subaltern agenda are to be scrutinized in the paper with the aid of Marxist, postcolonial, and psychoanalytical theories. Morris Kenny was a poet from the Native American space, and he published a series of poems uh, titled Molly Brand, Poems of War, Carving Hawk, and received critical appreciation of for exploring the theme of Native American consciousness. He was awarded the prestigious American Book Award in 1984 for the Mama Poems, and his short story collections are also well acclaimed. With the use of correlatives like berries, which are central to the Mohawk culture, Kenny intends to reclaim the past days of traditional life. All the numerous tribes of the American subcontinent had days of glory where they experienced an autonomy over their land and the joy of living a carefree life. They believed they belonged to the nature, not nature belonged to them. Each of these tribes possessed their own culture and tradition that had developed, or that had developed over thousands of years ago. So it is obvious that the cultural symbols would appear and reappear in the works of the aboriginals. The reason behind this loud acclaim is their status of being marginalized. The Native American space was being colonized for thousands of years by the col colonial powers of France, uh, Spain, England, and so on. They propagated the colonial ideology through the discourses of a civilization project and the white man's burden, and they disseminated power. According to Foucault, power is exercised than possessed, and this exercise of power made these communities marginalized. Where there is power, there is resistance, again by Foucault, and this resistance state conceptual rendering in the post-colonial Native American literature. The hegemony of the colonizers continued and still continues in, cert in, uh, in certain aspects among the Native American tribes. The primary attraction of the colonial powers to expand in the Native American lands is their material greed. They expand ruthlessly, claiming Native American lands and killing masses of natives. The Wounded Knee Massacre is an example. They intrude upon the forest without considering the ecological aspect or ecological stability. They used, uh, to borrow two terms from Louis Althusser, the repressive state apparatus as well as the ideological state apparatus to reign over the natives. The natives try to assimilate to the culture of the colonizers under the influence of the colonial ideology, considering themselves inferior and their culture too inferior. This stereotypical representation of the natives and the crafted histories about them resulted in the erosion of ethnic pride and collective identity. According to the theory of Peter Barry, the post-colonial culture as well as literature would go through the phases of adopt, adapt, and adapt. Kenny's works can be located in the third, third phase, that is the adept phase. Thus, being in the adept phase, Kenny strives to infuse culture-specific symbols in his work recurrently and thus configure ethnicity through his works. Our next concern is how these correlatives or culture-specific symbols work in the consciousness of the Native Americans. According to Freud, in order to escape from a trauma, we need to mourn over it. Our melancholy must be transformed to mourning and in order to mourn, we need an object. The trauma must be spatio-temporally fixed. Ethnic correlatives are such objects to mourn at and thus channelize melancholy to escape the trauma of being colonized ones. La Capra has incorporated this concept and appropriated melancholy as uh, acting out of trauma and mourning as working through of trauma. Hence, Kenny's correlatives or object to mourn at is berries, the blood red berries, which can be considered as a metaphor for the Mohawk tribal culture. Kenny tries to revive ethnic pride and collective identity to the use of common cultural symbols. According to Nietzsche, unlike other organisms that live in the present, human beings cling to their past memories. It is from their personal and collective histories that they configure their consciousness. Thus, Kenny con reconfigures the collective identity of the Native Americans through the application of various cultural specific symbols. 
The ethnic correlative of Bloodbury is perpetually appear in the poem, short stories, and autobiographical prose pieces of Morris Kenny. Yakini and wild strawberries are replete with the recurrence of the images of Bloodberries. Kenny's poem, Wild Strawberries, speak of sense of loss. Kenny explores the loss of their tribal culture of, cult of cultivating and harvesting wild strawberries. This is a communal activity so much close to nature with which Kenny could identify himself and with his community. With an intense passion, he, he nurtures, he laments over the loss of culture of strawberry farming, while I quote Woody Strawberries, which is a phrase from the poem Wild Strawberries, which is imported from Mexico, grown by Mexican farmers. Being someone with a rich, rich tradition of growing strawberries, he feels the imported berries without color or sweetness. The lost color and sweetness of the berries can be associated with the lost past splendor of being in a community and the togetherness thus obtained. Discovering that the important things cannot give him happiness, he contemplates on the berries of his fields. He calls those berries of his tradition as my wild blood berries. He is in fact identifying himself with the tribal culture he belongs to. The berries and the berry cultivation or the berry uh, harvestation symbolize his tradition. Those berries for Kenny stained his face, honeyed his tongue and healed the sorrow in his flesh. This sorrow in his flesh signifies that only the tradition of this tribe could heal the trauma of assimilation and being colonized. Uh, all the important things failed to render any kind of healing. Towards the end of the poem, uh, the poem actually ends in a desperate note. I sat here in Brooklyn eating Mexican berries, which I did not pick, nor do I know the hands which did or their stories. He is not at all aware of the stories of the people who cultivated the imported bury. So he could only associate with his own tribal background and he could identify only with that, not with the external uh, agencies or any imported things. All the Any of those foreign goods can provide him with any kind of a healing, I mean, a healing towards the trauma of being assimilated or being colonized. The Yes, I'm concluding. The other story, Yakini, the Wild Strawberries is a poem, and the short story Yakini 2 present a similar kind of a situation where the protagonist is Lena, a Native American old lady. She tried very much intensely to assimilate throughout her life, and towards the end of her life, she is getting a kind of realization, revelation that only tribalism or her ethnic uh, consciousness or ethnic background could help her to coming out of the internal trauma she is facing now. And in this story, we can see like uh, Lena is uh, associating the de the color of the berries, the cultural symbol berries like blood, menstrual blood, hospital blood, scarlet like morning star, crimson like clouds after the sunset, red like this bottom of naughty child like anger on the cheek she could associate any kind of daily things or routine things with this blood berries she cannot associate any foreign things with her identity only tribalism and her native background could give her a, a kind of uh, relief or healing and let me conclude uh, my paper there is a perpetual recurrence of the ethnic correlative of uh, wild red strawberries in the works of uh, Maurice Kenny, whether it is a poem, a short story, or a prose piece. This recurrence, or rather reclaiming of the past or tradition, helps the author as well as his community to get out of the trauma of being colonized and being assimilated. This recurrence also makes uh, them capable enough uh, to retain ethnic pride, re-establish re collective identity, and thus resist colonial hegemony. And resisting this colonial hegemony would assert their space in the present socio-cultural scenario. Uh, thank you for so much for your uh, for me. Thank you so much for your patient time, and I'm concluded my paper. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Alka. Uh, your paper on blood berries uh, that was really uh, another excellent one uh, where there is power there is resistance and you have shown how uh, this adapt phase uh, which you talked about the consciousness of uh, native americans in particular of this particular writer 
एंड हाउ वेरीज बिकम को कल्चरल मेटाफर्स एंड सिम्बल्स and as for the psychological cure which comes after melancholic consciousness which you talked about i see yes. that there is a, there is they also their narration works as a therapeutic uh, yes uh, yes it has a therapeutic value also so yes. thank you uh, um, uh, once again about this reclaiming of the past aspect of uh, uh, this writer thank you once again thank you so much we we have one last uh, presentation by a nilofer which was not earlier but it was incorporated later on so a nilofer is she here hello hello sir uh, nilofer are you there okay yes um, sir yes sir good evening okay so good evening so nilofer i am going to give you 10 minutes and please uh, uh, give your presentation on post development in mamang dies the black hill black hill yeah okay so thank you sir good evening sir and everyone present here i sincerely thank the organizing team for arranging such a international conference on this topic and for providing me this opportunity and i am here to present in a nutshell my paper titled post developmentalism in uh, mamang dies the black hill Uh, starting with a few words about the author she mamang dai is a renowned northeast indian tribal writer from arunachal pradesh she belongs to the adi tribal community who are residing at the southern himalayan region the adis are one of the most populous indigenous groups in the state of arunachal pradesh in her debut novel the legends of penzam dai has documented the reaction of the adis to the changes brought into their lands I have actually attempted to scrutinize one of the significant challenges confronted by the tribal communities, uh, that is, uh, them being misrepresented by the non-tribal world. The lives of the tribal communities are being distracted by such sort of intrusion by the outsiders, and the ethnocentric attitude that contributes so much to the further deterioration of the indigenousness. The problem of having misperceptions towards the tribal communities. could only be tackled by enlightening oneself with a proper knowledge of the tribal ways of living many of the indian tribes are still remaining helpless and this has made them vulnerable to false accusations and exploitations for the people for they are unaware of their rights being stolen around the world the tribal histories are manipulated and are made to fade with the accelerating modernization the situations have further worsened because under the banner of development the lands of the tribal people are usurped and exploited by making use of their innocence around the world the tribal communities are deracinated and uh, for example the indian santal tribes are struggling being exposed to these uh, mushrooming modernization Mamang Dai, coming to the novel, sir. Mamang Dai in the Black Hill has delineated very well the relationship uh, of the uh, tribal people uh, with their environment, uh, particularly the land, and she explicates the insurgencies of the two northeast Indian tribes. They are the Mishnis and the Adi people uh, who are uh, struggling a lot against the colonial power. So both the Adis and uh, Mishni, both their ways of resistance is being registered in the book. The novel opens uh, with the Adi people. of uh, uh, sorry residing in uh, the village of mabo getting ready to protect their territory from the britishers who are attempting to enter the tribal villages through the character of uh, uh, protagonist uh, gajinsha and gemor his wife the author informs the readers about the uninformed truth about the valor the courage of adi and mishmi tribes men who have given a tough fight to the british officers for interfering in the tribal norms these histories actually mark the chivalrous nature of the tribes men which are either being ignored or unnoticed the protagonist uh, kadinsha is actually a tribal chief who is imprisoned and put to death by the british officers without even proving his case he is falsely accused for assassinating a french missionary a priest uh, named father nicolas crick who has come to this village uh, with the aim of finding a route
tribe or showing uh, the route to tibet and they this develops a fascination in them because uh, father uh, people like him are uh, trying to use their economic condition this is how they finally invade the native lands so father uh, nicholas crick wins the trust of the people by serving as a medicine man initially and thus the english medicines are introduced to the native people so the shamanism and their faith system is actually getting disturbed in this and their way of uh, administrative system like they have a kebang system uh, a regulated with a tribal system is substituted with the colonial set of rules which is understood by the imprisonment of a tribal chief by the colonial power his uh, this actually leaves other tribal chieftain in shock which sets the stage for an anglo abor war these people are actually they were addressed as abors and this heralded the supremacy of the colonial power that has been uh, because the colonial power had been awaiting for such an opportunity to establish their uh, empire and these kinds of events are actually uh, accentuated in the paper are uh, giving them to be acknowledged because they are usually suspended or unheeded to be trivial things actually these con- these uh, so called or considered minor episodes have disfigured the native communities whose histories are being manipulated so post development theory has uh, has voiced out uh, the essential criticism of the modernization theory from a post colonial angle for it had been labeled to propagate ethnocentric ideas for this reason the novel has been analyzed based on the ideas of post development school of thought i concluded my finding saying that it is time to dismantle the ethnocentric approach and misrepresentations towards the fading tribal whose lives are jeopardized they are actually to be cherished and treasured since traditional cultures forms an identity of a nation and simultaneously build the nation's character as described by the indonesian professor zainul hasidian in his research article preservation of cultural heritage and natural history through game based learning dai has given voice to her tribe and her uh, neighboring tribe says tell them we were good tell them we had uh, some things to say and we cannot read and write so we tell stories uh, and uh, with this i conclude sir okay uh, well uh, thank you very much nilofa you uh, um, concluded well within the time given to you uh, that concludes uh, the presentations of this session as far as uh, nilofa's presentation is concerned this period or historical novel which is uh, set between 1847 and 1855 uh-huh. if i got, got it correctly the pre independence yeah, uh, resistance um, it shows how history lives forever it shows how old sins have long shadows now the uh, the onslaught of the east india company the inter- intertribe unrest the coming of the missionaries all these aspects were, uh, were covered in this novel about which nilofer talked yes yeah, and she tells that she told us that uh, the tribals they are not one homogenized people but they have their richness diversity and yeah. and differences as well so uh, uh, very well spoken about this uh, uh, work from a northeastern um, um, uh, arunachali writer nilofa uh, thanks once again now as Thank i you, uh, i Thank have you, already sir. given my uh, comments about the various presentations but uh, just one a uh, brief comment that uh, out of the six presentations uh, i see the first three that by dr pathan by shakil and uh, sayed and, and uh, by jigish falling into one category that is broadly speaking because they talked about the socio cultural uh, thrust and socio cultural space uh, mainly in one way or the other broadly speaking very broadly speaking and the uh, last three presentations uh, that by athira uh, alka and nilofer i see them um, proving how there are cultural links between the marginalized people irrespective of nation and race everywhere uh, well um, we, 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 the presentations are over but may i take 5 minutes uh, i mean may i give 5 minutes to the audience to pose any queries or give any short comments short comments 
or queries uh, to any of the presentations. Otherwise, we will conclude. Uh, okay, uh, I guess uh, uh, everyone is satisfied and uh, there are no queries or observations. It has been a long day for you guys, uh, not for me really, but for you guys, uh, you have been attending this conference for three days. So uh, I would like to thank all the participants, the paper presenters, the uh, other delegates, audience who were present through the sessions, especially during this session once again. And uh, uh, shall we call it a day? Thank you.